and it's recording. Richard Heiberg, hello. Hi, Piero. I'm very happy to speak to you. As my audience known, you have been one of the inspiring authors of all my work for the last 15 years. And um, you're author of uh, so many books. Uh, I will actually mention some of them with my glasses on. The Party's Over, <laughs> Oil, War, and the Fate of Industrial Societies. 2003, that's the first book I, uh, I read of you. And then, you know, Peak Everything, um, The End of Growth, Snake Oil was fascinating. I, we had an, an interview on that book. Uh, Afternburn, Society Beyond Fossil, fossil Fuels, A Renewable future and recently power the limits and prospects for human survival which is a very timely book considering we may not have electricity anymore in europe soon so it's timely that we no. can talk about that and and do this interview with electric power computer <laughs> <laughs> my perhaps to start with because this was where uh, i was fascinated by your, the book the part is over is that our use of fossil fuel determines very much our, especially for large countries like the United States or, or our capacity to, to function as modern economies. And we adapted to that way of life, which means high population, which means enormous uh, comfort, but also war to mm. get the resources from where they are, and they're not spread evenly around the world. So um, today we are in the middle of another war, and possibly a very big one, possibly mm -hmm. World War III starting, and we understand that Ukraine is the battlefield between, on one hand, the Western powers, and on the other hand, Russia and maybe China behind it. Is there something about oil and energy uh, that is linked to this? Uh, well, um, obviously so. I mean, uh, Russia's uh, economic power is based on its uh, enormous uh, ability to produce mostly oil and natural gas, also coal. Uh, Russia is also exporting coal, but it's not one of the one of the uh, world's top coal producers. Um, but uh, you know, the, the the war is is over. Uh, geopolitics, uh, and depending on on whose side you listen to, it's either you know NATO trying to hem in Russia uh, and keep it from having the the rights of a global power, uh, or it's Russia seeking to you know regain its status as a superpower by uh, overwhelming its neighbors. You know, you can choose sides in that debate, but what's uh, not so much uh, arguable is that the uh, Russia's oil supplies are the bargaining chip in this conflict. And uh, with Europe uh, allying itself with Ukraine, that means that Europe is being cut off from supplies of energy from Russia. I mean, this is this is obvious. This is happening. Uh, that's raising prices of natural gas for uh, European users, which means that uh, European users of natural gas are getting more of their natural gas from international shipments via LNG, liquefied natural gas tankers, which then in turn means that other countries in the world that produce natural gas, like the United States, uh, are sending more and more of their natural gas to Europe because they'll get a higher price for it if they sell it there than if they sell it domestically, which then in turn means that uh, natural gas prices are going up in the U.S. And this is going to be a much bigger problem this winter than it is currently. Already natural gas prices are very high in the U.S., but they're going to go much higher in the next few months. Um, similarly, global oil prices are going up as a result of some of uh, Russia's oil be being taken off the market. So these high energy prices are uh, gnawing away at the global economy, which is, um, I, I, I would say, going uh, in a slow march toward recession or worse. Uh, 
uh, right now. So regardless of, of your you know, political analysis of the conflict, it's, it's definitely an energy war. And, uh, and it's, in, it's still in its early stages. Uh, if, if somehow miraculously the war were to come to an end tomorrow, then much of, of the pain and suffering could be avoided, but it doesn't look as though that's likely to happen. So this winter we'll likely see uh, for Europeans uh, really serious consequences. I mean, firewood is in very short supply in Europe. You know, uh, everyone who can possibly heat their home with wood has already bought up all of the firewood supplies. So, you know, our forests going to be cut down this winter to keep houses warm. I, we'll see, but it's it's really getting that dire. Uh, and where I sit in the United States, we've been spared most of the pain simply because the U.S. is the world's foremost oil and natural gas producer. But we're still subject to higher prices as a result of the war, and that's eating away at the U.S. economy, which is poised to to plunge into recession. Mm. One of the starting points of your work, of your, your many books, is peak oil. Now, our, our detractors, because I use that point as well, and I quote your books in, in my best-selling books uh, about economic collapse, um, which I predicted to be between 2020 and 2025. Uh, that's interesting. But uh, <laughs> that, that, the, our detractors say, oh, well, peak oil will never happen because there is... Um, you know, uh, shale and all that. Mm -hmm. Now we are, we have a few years have passed. What is your opinion? What is your, uh, the facts that you can, you can base it on about peak oil? Right. Uh, well, back in the early years of this century, uh, the forecast among those who were studying oil depletion the forecast was that world oil production would peak sometime between 2005 and 2010. What we've actually seen is that world conventional oil production hit a plateau in 2005 and hasn't really increased since then. And it's getting more and more difficult to maintain that plateau of uh, global conventional oil production. Meanwhile, uh, the cavalry came to the rescue in the form of uh, shale oil uh, produced by hydrofracturing and horizontal drilling. And this took place almost entirely in the U.S. because the, the economic and political conditions were ripe here. There are geological conditions in a few other countries that could enable the production of shale oil, Argentina, for example, uh, even Britain. But it's not happening because the political and economic situation isn't, isn't satisfactory there. One of the economic uh, conditions that enabled this to happen was extremely low interest rates because as it turns out, it takes uh, a lot of cash to drill wells. You know, by, by its very nature, shale oil requires drilling and drilling and drilling because each individual well produces a lot at first and then production declines very rapidly. So in order to maintain production, you have to drill well after well in, in short order. Well, that's expensive. So the shale industry in the US, even with relatively high oil prices over the last decade, has mostly lost money. And they kept themselves in business by borrowing uh, enormous amounts of money to keep, keep drilling. Now with very high oil prices, uh, shale is actually profitable in the US. But there isn't so much drilling, and there are two reasons for that. Interest rates have gone up, makes it harder to borrow. Uh, investors are now demanding some returns on their investments. They're, they're tired of seeing red in the balance sheets in all of these companies. So they want to see some profits, and they want to see some, some returns on their investments. That's one side of it. The other side of it is that these places that produce shale oil have been drilled so full of holes that there aren't that many places left to drill. Uh, in, in a typical uh, shale gas or shale oil, let's see, let's keep with shale oil play, like the Bakken in uh, North Dakota, there are relatively small areas where the resource is concentrated enough 
that it will be profitable to drill. Uh, sometimes geologists call them sweet spots. Well, those have been drilled so full of holes that, as I said, there's not much, <clears throat> not much opportunity left. So production in the back end is already in, in terminal decline. There's only one play in the US that still has the possibility of increasing production, and that's the Permian in Texas and New Mexico. And uh, production is still increasing there, but it, it's having to overcome declining production in the Bakken and in other areas. So when is shale oil production as a whole in the US going to peak out and start to decline? Uh, probably in the next few years could happen next year, the year after that, almost certainly before 2030. So uh, peak oil was delayed. And a, a lot of us who were writing about it in the early part of the century didn't see this coming. I did not forecast or foresee that uh, fracking would make this much of a difference. Uh, it was a surprise. We were wrong. But nevertheless, the principles are still true. Uh, oil is a depleting resource. We extract it using the low-hanging fruit principle. So yeah. we get the easiest, cheapest stuff first. And that means that as time goes on, what's left is going to be more expensive, more difficult to access. And that's exactly what we're seeing. It seems that uh, in the last few weeks, Saudi Arabia, the, still the largest pr uh, um, producer, or, um, extractor of oil. Well, actually, the U.S. is now the world's US foremost okay. producer of oil. Yeah. Uh, the second. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's right but up there. One yes. of the largest uh, and traditionally one of the largest um, has refused to increase production, mm -hmm. actually admitting that their reserves are actually much, much, much lower than they what they always had uh, had announced. Is that a sign that uh, we have uh, passed that peak oil and that now even large producers want to not hoard, but keep it for um, uh, and not spoil it away, at least not a low price? Right. Well, uh, the Middle Eastern producers are sitting on still large amounts of oil, but those giant and super giant oil fields have been producing in many cases since the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s. Those are tired old oil wells. And if they make the effort to increase the rate of production in those tired old oil wells, that will mean that the ultimate, the amount that they can ultimately produce from those wells will, will decline, will be less. Um, they, they can produce the most from those wells over the long term if they eke it out in smaller amounts over a longer time. So that's what they're trying to do. So uh, President Biden went to the Middle East back in July, I think it was July 15th, and did a bit of groveling to, <laughs> to try to convince OPEC to increase their, their rate of production. And initially they announced that they would, they would do that, but not much came of it, uh, simply because they can't, they're, they're physically incapable of producing much more. And if they did, it would be to their long-term detriment. So now OPEC is talking about cutting their production by 2 million barrels a day. Well, what they're actually talking about is reducing their quotas by 2 million barrels a day. But OPEC is already producing about a million barrels a day below quota. So realistically, they'd be taking about a million barrels a day off of the global market on top of uh, the reduction that's already come from, from Russia which is producing less oil than it was. So this, this is significant and it will raise global oil prices. So in the months ahead, we will see oil prices probably head up back toward $100 a barrel. But the, again, the, there's always the other side of the equation. In this case, the other side of the equation is demand. Um, if the global economy goes into a tailspin then oil demand will decrease and that could put downward pressure on oil prices. We saw this during the, the uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, global oil demand plummeted dramatically. Yes. And so oil prices did the same thing. And this could also happen as a result of a, a global recession. Yes, in fact, French um, French economist uh, and, and physicist, um, I think his name is, um, 
is it Pierre Jankovic, uh, yes. explains, or you probably know him, explains how uh, you can have um, a, a scarcity of oil at the same time prices going down. That's right. Uh, and it is it is true that as oil prices go up, the economy tanks, and then, then the prices drop, the economy restarts a little bit, and then and and so you can you can uh, zigzag down and it's a extremely painful experience for for our french um, listeners i want to remind that um richard heinberg's book are, some are, are available in french petrol la fête est fini and la fin de la croissance you can find them on on uh, in bookstores and if you really have to on amazon And um, and so the, the if you if you really cannot read English, you can find them in French. I just wanted to to mention that. Thank you for that. Uh, with pleasure. So, uh, speaking of your recent uh, of your latest book, uh, now I lost I lost the page because I have not read that one. I must I must find it. Uh, what is the exact title? It's about adapting, right? Uh, well, the 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 title is uh, power. Limits and Prospects for Human Survival. And it's a big picture book. It's, um, you know, if if I were to send and put a note in a bottle for future generations, uh, this book would be it. It's, uh, I've, it's the result of many years of, of thought and, and work. Uh, it's, a, it's a much more general and even philosophical work mm. than anything I've done previously. Because it's looking at power in uh, in the broadest, uh, most general terms. Power, of course, can be defined uh, simplest as the rate of energy transfer. We measure power in watts or horsepower, but also power is, is the ability to do something because we use energy to do things. Everything we do requires energy, walking, um, uh, <laughs> sending space shuttles into, <laughs> you know, everything we do requires energy. So energy is the, is the irreducible basis of, of existence. So the ability to do something is power, the, the, the power of flight, the, the power of speech, all of these things are using energy to accomplish something. But then there's also social power. And with social power, we're getting other people to do things. And uh, so the, the book looks at the develop, how human beings developed physical power and social power, how we came to dominate the planet, how we came to dominate each other. Uh, power is a good thing. You know, without it, we couldn't, we couldn't do anything at all. But it's possible to have too much of a good thing. And I think that's the essence of the of the predicament of humanity in the 21st century. With fossil fuels, we've obtained so much energy so quickly. We've enabled ourselves to do things that we could never do before uh, and at higher rates of speed and in, on a larger scale. And so we're overcoming physical limits on planet Earth, which seem good to us. We produce so much food. We access so many minerals and uh, metals from from the earth's crust and transform them into products, which we dispose of as waste. The result is extreme economic inequality and a drawdown of earth's resources and a disappearance of wild nature. And if we don't deliberately limit our own power by uh, limiting our use of energy, then the result is going to be uh, possibly human extinction. Uh, so that's, you know, that's the book in a nutshell. I, I discuss power self-limitation in nature and in human societies. Is it possible to self-limit? Yes, of course it is. It happens all the time in natural systems and it's happened in human systems throughout history. Is it likely to happen now? It's going to be very, very difficult because we have developed this ideology which says there are no limits. We human beings deserve to have all of these comforts and conveniences. And if we prevent any of our fellow humans from having them, of course, that's uh, completely um, politically incorrect. So where are we? We can only grow. Uh, the only solution for our problems is more growth. And yet it's growth itself that's causing the problems. Yes, I'm, I have actually ordered your book 
as we speak. Uh, so not in a library, but okay. Great. <laughs> prefer, most people prefer going to libraries. Um, yeah. Well, it's um, it's obviously very interesting because as 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 our audience is mostly interested about how you survive, but actually how to live yeah. in a, in a collapsing world, and hopefully uh, get into a stab stable uh, situation at some point. Certainly, it has less uh, a collapsing world will have less energy and as we discuss with uh, our friends and colleagues um uh, like uh, like uh, kunstler or or uh, greer and many others who are in this field of trying to you know awaken people and set the alarm uh, with more or less uh, data more or less uh, thoughts uh, certainly we try to imagine a future where we we have to deal with less energy and 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 it, even the economy is trans is energy transformed into something transport goods and heating and uh, and cooling in some cases so um my the, i think the elephant in the room and maybe maybe you will disagree with that the elephant in the room is the 8 billion people who live on planet earth today ah uh, how is it going to to work without massive violence and uh, reduction of that eight billion to something lower? Um, yeah. uh, well, I discuss this in the book quite a bit. Um, I mean, obviously, the, the the rational thing for us to do at this point in human history would be to deliberately and humanely reduce the scale of human population, and we should have started doing that back in the 1960s. There were were some efforts along those lines. Yeah, many do. And without those efforts, we probably would have 10 billion people right now if China hadn't had its one child policy and sure. Iran and other countries hadn't uh, hadn't had population policies, then the situation would be even worse. But unquestionably, without fossil fuels, 8 billion humans uh, that, that level of population is not sustainable. So um, the the overwhelming likelihood is that we we'll, we will see very high levels of mortality this century, and that has uh, absolutely awful uh, implications. Um, the highest level of mortality that we've seen in in recent historic times was during World War II. Uh, during those, what was it, five or six years, yeah. uh, 60, sixty million people died. Uh, today, we're adding 80 million people a year to the world's population. So even if you crammed all of World War II into one year, it wouldn't make up for the 80 million that we're adding. So th this is this is just a way of putting... Germ Germany is rearming, so... Yes, right, right. <laughs> but all I'm trying to do is to put into context... Yeah the level of mortality that we could be seeing over, over the next few decades. Um, it's something completely unprecedented in all human history. The only, the only qualitative precedent would be what the uh, indigenous peoples of the Americas experienced when the Europeans came and introduced diseases like smallpox. And these, uh, these native cultures experienced uh, uh, levels mortality such that up to 90% or more of uh, many of these societies disappeared. Uh, sometimes even before the first Europeans arrived on the scene because the, the diseases preceded them yeah, that is in true. their explorations. So this is what we may be looking at over the course of, of this uh, coming century. It's, it's not a pretty picture to contemplate. If we want to minimize that, of course, there are things we could be doing, which is again to reduce population, you know, voluntarily and humanely. And uh, there are many population organizations already working to that end. Um, restructuring societies so that we relocalize our food systems, because of course, food is going to be one of the important vectors of population either stabilization or reduction along with disease and war with, you know, the, the traditional horsemen of the apocalypse. Yeah. So um, if we want to minimize that mortality, you know, there are obviously things we can do. Unfortunately, there's not that much going on 
right now in any of those areas. Yes, that is true. And even the even conspiracy theorists uh, are um, are disappointed by <laughs> the fact that if if there is a plan of depopulation, it certainly is not started yet because clearly, and I've worked in 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 Africa and the Middle East. Um, the population growth is has slowed certainly today. Yeah. For example, in North Africa, in the last fifty years, we went from six to less than two. Uh, that's in Morocco, in Algeria, in Tunisia, countries which traditionally had a lot of birth rates. So they are very similar to European um, birth rates, with maybe fifty years lagging, but it's the same mm -hmm. cycle. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, not so. The the it has reduced, but it's still very high, and uh, and indeed, um, as uh, as many move to the Western world, many Africans move to Europe, for example, the um, the lodging, the the heating, the way of life obviously explodes, and so 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 the energy consumption, and um, and um, and because of cultural differences, the the mixing is going to be very difficult when that energy retracts. And we are we are very um, concerned in Europe, and I presume in the U.S. as well in different aspects, but but probably not as much with, without the explosive mix that Europe is creating. Um, yeah, is is um, on a on a day to day life to to go back to what we can do because this is really what is interesting, and I'm sure you 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 touch on this on your book again. I, I've just ordered, so I will read it in the next few weeks. Um, what can People, families, um, and by the way, I actually kind of uh, can I can I voice a disagreement? Sure, absolutely. Um, I will humbly disagree on the fact of limiting children for the following reason. Um, <clears throat> usually, it is smart people who limit children voluntarily, and we need smart people to solve the problems that are coming. And I would assume that maybe. Uh, intelligence is overrated. That's possible. <laughs> That's very possible because it's intelligent people who created the <laughs> yes. comfort that is that is creating the mess we're in. Um, however, um, I don't believe in the government or the state saying who should or shouldn't have children either. Therefore, I'm more, you know, the in uh, the, the consequence has to be survival of the fittest. Which which is a dreadful proposition because it is right. means it means war. Let's you know I, I let's not mince the thoughts there. So I'm I'm in I'm in that circular thought where you need to have children to have to have smart children and therefore to solve problems. But the if you do that, you cannot choose who can have children and who can't because that would be really really unfair and and, and dictatorial. And therefore, you still have a lot of people, and therefore, you have the problem. So, uh, I don't know how to square that, or to square yeah. circle, or to circle that square. I don't know in English how it how it works. Um, yeah, that was my my only disagreement. But you know, yeah, you know, I my advice is if um, if you feel a calling toward parenthood, and you feel that you can provide your children with the kinds of uh, not just material advantages, but also cultural and intellectual advantages that would enable them not only to survive in the decades ahead, but to be helpful in the solutions of some of these problems. Great, have children, you know, make that investment. But, uh, you know, too many children are born into families where it's just you know, assumed to be the thing to do, and and there's no real uh, sense of provision of of, yeah, of yeah. these kinds of you know purposeful uh, dedication of, of of you know a cultural investment. So you know, it's it's uh, people who don't read our books. Yeah, right. Now, now to go back on some positive thoughts. I'm sorry, I just wanted to because I no, think no. It's, it would it's important to 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 show that paradox there but what can people do on a day-to-day -day basis to prepare because you know it's always this paradox where if you say and i've been saying it for at least 12 years collapse is is soon 2020 2025 maybe later maybe i'm mistaken it's 2030 but it looks like it's it's here 
yeah. and um, and people say, oh, it's ten years from now. You know, I, I'll, I'll think about it. I'll think about it. You know, in two thousand, just when it starts, I'll, I'll, you know, I moved to the, a farm. I, I, I was this morning working in the garden, and it's ten year process to get fertile soil that doesn't need uh, mechanics, doesn't need an yeah, engine, yeah. doesn't need. And and yet I require electricity, but um, solar panels, all these things take time to to build, to set up. That's right. And um, so, what can people do today to start to 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 adapt to this coming world? Right. Well, the first thing is don't wait. As you say, it takes time to do these things. It takes time to to gain the skills to learn how to live closer to the soil, uh, to to learn self defense, for example. That. It, you know, you can't just go to a karate class and, you know, next week you're, <laughs> you're a black belt or something. Um, whatever you want to do to prepare is going to require time and investment of energy and attention. So the sooner you start, the better off you'll be. Um, <clears throat> I, in addition to the obvious things uh, that you, you've mentioned of uh, learning to grow your own food, uh, learning how to repair things, uh, having sources of energy, having a home that's well insulated, uh, things like that. Also, it's really important to get, your, get to know your neighbors. Uh, I, I've been through a... Uh, a disaster situation. We had wildfires here in Sonoma County uh, a few oh, yeah. years ago. And, uh, and, you know, the power was out for many days. Uh, it, 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 there were, there were a couple of days where we were evacuated and we didn't know whether our house was still standing. It was, it was a very grim time, but during that, you know, roughly two weeks, um, having neighbors with whom we were on very good friendly terms made all the difference in the world. We got to get, after we returned to our homes, we, uh, you know, the refrigerators weren't working because there was no grid power. So we had block parties where we shared food. Um, my, my friend had another friend who was happened to be a solar engineer and he came over our, our even though we have solar panels, because the grid power was out, we didn't have electricity. Uh, there was a little glitch in our inverter. So mm -hmm. uh, his friend came over and worked on our inverter for like four hours, didn't charge us a penny, but we were then able to have electricity and we were able to share some conveniences with our friends as a result of that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you have good relations with your neighbors, there are all kinds of advantages that flow from that. Whereas if you don't have good relations with your neighbors, all kinds of bad things can flow from that. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so that's very important. Um, and uh, just, you know, maintaining your health and, uh, and, and your state of mind, psychological health is, is extremely important in, in times like, uh, like now and times like we're approaching. Uh, so uh, finding ways to to cope, to uh, to keep yourself uh, engaged and interested in life. Um, I, I, for myself, it's music. Uh, learning to play the piano. I've played violin for many years, but I'm learning to play the piano now. Bach and and uh, Scott Joplin and Jelly Roll Morton and stuff like that. It's wonderful. I could I could talk about that for a long time, but. Um, uh, if you have, if you don't feel as though you have anything really to live for, then you're not likely to put the make the investment in what's needed in order to survive. Now you touched a very important point, and uh, the psychological approach to 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 this preparation. And as it happens, my next book is going to be, and I'm about half of in in it, finishing it hopefully, is about managing your fears. And I noticed that a lot of people are conscious about what is happening and more and more people are unconsciously conscious, which is already a step forward from being completely unaware. Now people start to feel that something is very fragile. And, and you know, until COVID, the, the, the mass media and the governments 
they try to scare you on some little things. You may have a heart attack by this. You may have uh, cholesterol by that. And from COVID, it switched to fear, fear, fear. Um, and um, a lot of people suffered from that. And, and I believe a lot of people are ill because of that now. And um, as people start to understand that they may have difficult times ahead and that the difficulty is increasing, the anxiety level is 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 going up very much. And I've been writing this book since at least six years now, and studying because it's a, uh, has a lot of science in it. How, in in your opinion, because presumably you, your readers, as they read your book, they also end up in fear and 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 and. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is not what we try to do. We try to tell people, I know. be careful, but the result is a lot of people are scared uh, and, and probably even more scared than anxious. And that can be debilitating. That can be uh, a harm to your health. And, and so we, we inadvertently create this process, which may be an inevitable process. How would you, how would you tell people uh, how not to be scared, how not to be anxious? And, and what would be your, or even how you manage to not be anxious and scared? Yeah, well, um, you know, these things are, are happening whether we pre are prepared for them or not, uh, psychologically or otherwise. Um, so to my mind, having a, a contextual understanding for why these things are happening, whether it's an energy crisis or uh, war or or whatever, having that contextual understanding makes it easier to accept what's going on rather than freaking out and uh, and reacting in ways that don't really uh, serve your long-term survival prospects. So even though we're in a sense, scaring people, as you say, um, before the events actually are happening, in a way, it's like an inoculation, right? Uh, an inoculation is can it can be unpleasant. Uh, if you get a COVID <laughs> shot, you know, sometimes you don't feel very well for it for a, maybe a day or two afterward. But then if you get COVID, it's, it's a lot less. Same thing with the kind of information that we're sharing. We're helping people to uh, pre-adapt to conditions that will be emerging over the next few years. And that pre-adaptation may not be fun. You know, It may trigger anxiety, but the anxiety that it's triggered is going to be much easier to handle than the, the events themselves will be. So take that anxiety and work with it, and then uh, you'll, you'll be better off in the long run. So how do I handle the anxiety? Well, I've already said, you know, partly it's just keeping interested in, in life in, in all sorts of ways, you know, uh, interpersonal, friends, neighbors, family, uh, nature, uh, spending time in nature because nature is is the is the source of all the healer of, of all and and the, the greatest source of beauty. For me, beauty is uh, a, a, a bigger aspect of life with every day I, I live. You know, it's it's not something ephemeral. It's not something we can do without. It's as much a source of nourishment as as food or water. Um, and, and nature is the greatest source of beauty, along with, you know, art and, and music and so on. But uh, if if we don't have beauty, then what what's the point? Well, I presume that um, watching a, a very nice forest or, or very, in my case, I have mountain views here in, in, across the window, listening to a Bach toccata in D minor, for sure. <laughs> there's very little things that can beat that yeah. uh, in life. Um, I agree. I agree with what you said. And um, I think our, our audience um, sometimes struggles with the day-to-day -day, uh, activities. And it's true that as the economy becomes harder for many people, um, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult mm -hmm. for people to hear that they have to perhaps slow down, that they have to... Um, and yet taking that step back or step on the side 
um, maybe reconsidering um, consumption. We don't need TV screens as much as we think we do. Um, we don't need big cars. We don't need a lot of the things we think we need. Um, then we need less money, and with less money, we can have more time yes. we need to, to work less. And um, and it's a virtuous cycle that we we can switch away from the vicious consumption in debt cycle. And um, the um, now if if you now perhaps as a last question, let's move to hundred years from now. Yeah, way after you and me will be gone. But maybe our children or grandchildren or great grandchildren or certainly the new generation, then they will not have they will just maybe read in books or remember from oral history. Yes. Uh, how was how was the world with this magic oil and gas and and global society and going for holidays across half the world and back? Um, how will they? First of all, how they, will they judge us, perhaps, and how will they, um, how would they live? Do you think in a in a century from now? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm hoping that by a century from now, there will be a sense that, um, you know, those people did all of that simply because they didn't know any better, and it was it was just human nature. If that if all of that energy was available. It was just human nature that, of course, they would they would use it. By that time, uh, a lot of adaptation will already have taken place. Probably a hundred years from now, uh, children will be growing up whose parents had no personal experience of all of this wealth. Okay. Um, what I'm concerned about is actually the, the 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 children who are growing up now and who are who will be born in in the next years as they grow up and they look at us uh, the people of the so-called baby baby boomers and gen xers and so on i think they're they're not going to feel very good about us <laughs> frankly <laughs> yeah i'm I gen mean, x and um, my kids uh, think i'm a boomer <laughs> and I'm <upset> that. <laughs> yeah, right. But they're they're going to look at at our generations and they'll yeah. say, "Look, you had all the information that you needed." And uh, with a few exceptions, you know, you and you and I and our colleagues, with a few exceptions, you did nothing about it. You know, we had limits to growth in 1972. Yeah. Uh, Small is beautiful. Uh, Silent yeah. Spring. All of those great books that laid out in in clear explanation and and exquisite detail, you know how society was becoming unsustainable and what would happen if we kept moving in the same direction, and yet we we did nothing about it. Real is in effect. So I don't think they're going to look very kindly on us. I think they're going to say those people raped the earth pillaged the resources, used it all, and left us with nothing. Yeah, we're, but... living, we're living in a blasted landscape, and, uh, and uh, the soil is, most of the soil is gone, minerals are gone, the oceans are empty of fish, the forests have been cut down, and it was their fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can uh, we can fly to Hawaii for the weekend and we get Viagra. So yeah, right. <laughs> so, I don't know. Yeah, uh, and, how, and we can we, we complain about high gas high gasoline prices. Yeah. How how do you think they will live um, the day to day life? You think it because obviously history even even when empire collapses uh, and and what you say is very similar to Jared Diamond's thesis that. Civilization choose to to die. They 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 actually have a conscious decision to say, well, we're not going to change, and that's it. And the elites prefer to. They think they will die last. Therefore, they 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 usually don't change, but they they get taken over uh, by the collapse. Um, however, we usually don't go back in a linear way, just as we we went up. We mm -hmm. sometimes have. Um, jumps into into something different where you have a hybrid of right. 
technology perhaps that can be sustainable. We certainly have incredible knowledge today about agriculture um, and we can still apply it on, on plants, on chemistry, for example, chemistry that we can still keep uh, without needing mechanization to grow acres and acres of fields. We can apply this to very smaller lands and yet knowledge which is vastly superior to what we had 100 years ago, for example. Mm -hmm. And I can certainly have productivity in my garden, um, even if it's the mountains with a little bit of permaculture and a little bit of uh, of knowledge of which which plants go well together, uh, because I've read chemistry books about what these plants eat or, or need. Yes, which probably my great grandfather would say, well, everyone knows that. We don't know why <laughs> we need to put onions and potatoes together and things like that. Um, and indeed, in America, you had corn and beans growing together. That's right. And things like that, because they knew that the 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 the, 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 the I, I, what's in, in name in English Compa uh, companion planting exactly. They just knew it yeah. by by uh, trial and error, and yeah. we 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 have this knowledge. So hopefully that knowledge is not lost. Do you think we will have a hybrid hybrid civilization where we have a lot of labor that is done by hand, and at the same time a lot of knowledge that is kept into very precious books and and maybe even you know, whatever computers, but very long lasting with no planned obsolescence in it. And yeah. and or, or what, what do you think it's going to look like if it's an exact most, fiction? Most likely, I think it will be a, a divergence of of uh, cultures so that there will be some societies, some communities that will be able to maintain perhaps even electricity and grid power and thereby still maintain a connection with a lot of the cultural knowledge that we've produced over the last century. Mm -hmm. um, but those communities will not be, you know, the only form of, you know, human society on the planet. Yeah. There will also be human beings who have reverted to a kind of hunter-gatherer way of life. But instead of hunting and gathering nuts and berries and roots and wild animals, they'll be hunting and gathering the remains of industrial civilization. Um, and that happens. <laughs> yeah, th those Maybe. those folks might might be uh, pretty nasty to encounter, actually. Uh, so and there and there may be various gradations in between. You know, uh, I, I think the, the future is not going to be just one you know, cultural adaptation universally across the board. It's going to, we're going to diverge into almost not different species, but very different cultural uh, ways of living. Uh, I think you're you're correct, and it can last a few centuries before we start again uh, the craziness of of growth. Although it may not be easy to find the easy easy energy as we had in the past, because that's um, right. Um, it takes way too long time to replenish. Uh, a question that I'm sure that people have bothered you with, and I want to to know how you answer that. Uh, I have my answer, but um, sometimes it's such a silly question. Um, what do you think of the abiotic fuel theory? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm not a uh, I, I'm not a, a, a geochemist, so I I'm not maybe the best person to ask about that. But I, I, I know uh, geologists, petroleum geologists and, and geochemists, and I've posed this question to them, and they're pretty skeptical. Um, it's, it's conceivable that, uh, and it's in, in fact, it's probable that some of our natural gas, not a very large percent, but uh, some of our natural gas may be of abiotic origin. But petroleum, <clears throat> probably not. It just can't, contains too many chemical signatures that can be traced right back to the original organisms yes. that uh, that produced it. And there is so, a uh, carbon-14 um, trace to them, yeah, which yeah. wouldn't happen if it was uh, from from minerals. Yeah. So I I, I don't. Uh, put any stock in, in the abiotic oil theory. And even if it were true, the fact is that we've been searching for oil exactly since since the 1850s. And all, the oil that's been found, we have depleted it to a very large extent. And those old abandoned oil fields do not appear to be re refilling. 
uh, to there, there have been a very few instances, but those uh, petroleum geologists have studied them pretty carefully. And where those oil fields seem to be refilling is from related geological structures that that's already had that oil in place and it's simply migrating back into those those structures to 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 finish actually you remind me of a question which is we we know including for example in california there are small fields that have been used for almost a century even probably more than a century now that are still producing a little bit you actually still yes. see when you're in southern california these little um pump jacks pumps, exactly yeah. and uh, so it could well be that in a century from now there will still be oil coming up just in small quantities how do you think that oil if if we can manage to maintain and as you said maybe in some regions we will i don't see russia stopping that technology and they have they have vast uh, quantities of it still um how how do you see the use of oil when it will be so scarce but yet available a little bit Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in in my view, of course, the, in, in all likelihood, my my view would not prevail. But nevertheless, in my my opinion, is that oil is too precious to burn. Mm -hmm. You know, it it, it has too many. Uh, it's you know, from a, a chemical standpoint, geo, uh, geochemical standpoint, it's just too useful and interesting uh, substance to to just burn once and for all when it could be made into <clears throat> materials uh medicines uh all kinds of things that could be useful and for a longer time uh and more valuable than just as as a, a fuel to be burned once and for all so that's that's what i would hope would happen but i I don't necessarily expect that that's what what would happen. <laughs> well, we'll we'll keep it for private jets. <laughs> yes, right. Well, Richard, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your time, and um, I will certainly read your book. And maybe it's an opportunity to to chat again uh, early next year, maybe about it. And um, if 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 you you are not happy, or if you are happy, whatever, if you want it. Translated in French, who knows? Maybe maybe I'll I'll get you some connections. It seems not that all would be great. Are available in French. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your chat. I will send you the link of this video as soon as it's up and uh, keep up keep up the good um, piano lessons. <laughs> Thank you. It's good talking with you, Piero. Take care. Take care. Have a great day. Mm -hmm. Bye.